This video is kindly sponsored by Keeps. Find out more later in the video. Hey, Forty Sue here. In the southeast of England, on the banks of the River Way, sits a quaint, leafy town known as Weybridge. Its prim streets are lined with artisan coffee shops and bohemian boutiques. And aside from once hosting the marriage of Henry VIII to Catherine Howard, it's enjoyed a fairly uneventful past. But earlier this year, the town's residents were scandalized by a mystery tree feller who, under cover of darkness, took a chainsaw to nearly 50 trees. Instead of taking the wood home with him, this timber tyrant left his woody corpses strewn across the town's paths, roads, and river, leaving the locals with an unsightly mess and a number of unsettling questions. Why, if the culprit didn't need the wood, did he embark on such a destructive spree? How did he manage to cut down so many trees without making a sound? And if a tree falls, but nobody is there to hear it, does it still make a sound? Whilst you're sitting there pondering philosophical questions such as this, you could also be saving your hair using keeps. I've had people close to me start to lose their hair as early as their 20s, and it's always an upsetting experience. If you're in the same boat, then you're not alone. Did you know, two out of three guys will experience some form of male pattern baldness by the time they're 35. But the best thing you can do to prevent hair loss is take the initiative right now and do something about it whilst you've still got hair left. You used to have to go to the doctor's office for a hair loss prescription, but now, thanks to Keeps, you can visit an online doctor and get the medication you need delivered directly to your door. I like Keeps because it makes treatment super easy by delivering your hair loss medication every three months, so you can say goodbye to awkward doctor visits and waiting in pharmacy checkout lines. There's a reason that Keeps has more five-star reviews than any of its competitors, and hundreds of thousands of men trust them for their hair loss prevention medication. If you're like me, you're probably not ready to lose your hair just yet, but prevention is key. The faster you act, the faster you'll see results, and the sooner you start using Keeps, the more hair you'll save. So, if you're noticing that you're losing your hair, do something about it. For a limited time, go to keeps.com forward slash 42, or click the link in the description below to receive 50% off your first order. Don't miss out. Perhaps that last question didn't unsettle the residents as much as the first two, but once upon a time, it did preoccupy the mind of an inquisitive Irish bishop, George Barclay, who, although it's debated, may have been the first person to ask that very question. Barclay was an 18th century philosopher who spent a lot of time pondering the nature of, well, nature. Philosophers are known for questioning things that others generally take for granted, like free will, for example, or whether there's a china teapot orbiting the sun. Of course there is. But in 1710, Barclay decided to out-philosophize everyone by claiming that the entire physical world just plainly doesn't exist. You see, Barclay was an idealist. Not in the way that word is often thrown around today to mean someone who's a little bit naive, like your grandma who just doesn't understand why that Mr. Putin man on the news can't just make friends with everyone. No, Barclay subscribed to a philosophical doctrine called idealism. Idealists believe that the essential nature of reality doesn't lie in the material world around us, but in things like consciousness, ideas, and reason. It's a tricky concept to get your head around, and you wouldn't be alone in raising an eyebrow or two. When the writer Samuel Johnson discovered Barclay's view, he was so outraged that he kicked a large stone and declared, I refute it thus. And that's because many of us subscribe to the pretty intuitive belief that there is a physical world, one that exists completely independently from us. We know this because our senses feed us information about it 
every second. And because, well, if we don't exist in a physical world, where the hell are we? But Barclay believed that the things our senses tell us about reality, and reality itself, are actually the same thing. Take a familiar object, like a strawberry. It has knowable properties. It's red, small, a little bumpy, and sweet. But now try to imagine that strawberry without the redness, and without its shape, or its texture, or its taste. It's pretty much impossible, because what is a strawberry without its properties? So, if objects are inseparable from their properties, and those properties can only be perceived as sensory experiences in our minds, then there can't be a physical world that exists separately to us, right? This was Barclay's doctrine, Essa est percipi, or to be is to be perceived. If we aren't there to perceive an object, it simply doesn't exist. Now, briefly returning to Johnson's foot kicking the stone, Barclay would have expected him to feel pain, but he would also have argued that the stone didn't exist outside of the sensory experiences it created, i.e. pain. And so, if a tree falls in a forest, but nobody is there to hear it, then, according to Barclay, no, it doesn't make a sound, because there is no tree. That all sounds completely mental, I know. But Barclay wasn't the first philosopher to question our relationship with reality. Around 70 years earlier, René Descartes released his magnum opus, Mediations on First Philosophy. In the second mediation, he considers how everything he knows about a piece of wax, its smell, colour and texture, changes once the fire melts it. The wax itself remains, but the sensory experiences don't. Then he rambles on about wax and his limbs for another five pages, before eventually reasserting a famous maxim he'd originally penned four years earlier. I think, therefore I am. Around this time, science was having a lot of fun overturning most of what we knew about the world. In the 1660s, Robert Hooke discovered the cell, showing that all living organisms are composed of tiny structural units that are imperceptible to the human eye. Meanwhile, Isaac Newton took an interest in colours, which, in hindsight, wasn't his smartest move, because in a dramatic demonstration of dedication to knowledge, he prodded the underneath of his eyeball by shoving a blunt sewing needle called a bodkin inside his eye socket, just to see what would happen. But every masochistic act has a silver lining, because in doing so he proved that white light is composed of a spectrum of seven visible colours. And if light itself is the source of colour, then it couldn't be a property that belonged to external objects. Objects have no colour. Instead, they reflect light, which our brains then interpret as colour. So, with scientists everywhere suddenly bulldozing every long-established axiom, it's hardly surprising that philosophers began to question the reality of the world. If an experience as fundamental as colour is purely a manifestation originating within our minds, how much influence do we actually have on reality? Of course, this kind of scepticism wouldn't be very useful in everyday life. Imagine, for example, explaining to your neighbour that you didn't feed her cat because there is no cat. So, let's just presume for the time being that I really exist, you really exist, and there are definitely things out there called trees that exist independently of us. If one of them fell, but you or I weren't there to hear it, would it make a sound? Well, put simply, the answer is, it depends how you define sound. 
According to psychoacoustics, the study of how humans perceive sound, when a tree falls, it compresses the air particles around it, causing them to vibrate. The faster it falls, the more they vibrate. Those air particles then vibrate the particles around them, creating airwaves. These waves travel through the air at 343 meters per second, transferring energy to surrounding objects. If your ear was one of those objects, a spiral structure within, known as the cochlea, would vibrate, which converts the physical energy of the wave into electrical impulses which surge to the brain through an auditory nerve. Finally, your brain does its human calculator thing to interpret those signals as sound in your mind. The bigger the vibrations, the louder the perceived sound. So, in a nutshell, if a tree falls but there is nobody there to hear it, then no. According to science, it wouldn't make a sound. Because sound is not a physical property of our world, it is simply the interpretation of information by the brain. Obviously, there would still be vibrations if you weren't around during the tree's demise, and those physical vibrations will have a small effect on the surrounding environment, but sound needs to be perceived to exist, and therefore requires a hearer to be present. And I can sort of prove to you that sound is not a physical property of our world, but something that only happens inside your head. Because your brain can be fooled pretty easily. Take horror films, for example. It would be inconvenient and probably illegal to convince an actor to actually chew human flesh. But you can create a pretty convincing zombie bite by chomping down on a tomato. You can crush a pepper to replicate a skull crush. And you can create the sound of intestines being pulled out by molesting a raw chicken, which oddly enough is not illegal. But we can take this neural trickery one step further still. If part of an audio recording is replaced by a period of silence, the gaps would be quite obvious. But if someone starts coughing <coughs> over someone else speaking, your brain simply works out what should be there in place of the coughs and fills in the gaps. And here's an even cooler example. Listen to this digital piano and see if you notice anything odd. At first, it just sounds like a cat trapped inside a piano having a seizure. But observe what happens once words are put on the screen. Creepy, right? This is because our brains utilize context and prior knowledge to make sense of the world around us. You understand English only because of the prior knowledge your brain possesses and the context that that person you're talking to is speaking English. Icelandic is just a bunch of complex vibrations. Yet an Icelandic native can decipher those vibrations because of his prior knowledge and context. Whereas you just hear the vague grumblings of an angry Viking. So, for yet another time in this video, to answer the old chestnut, if a tree falls in a forest and no one is around to hear it, does it make a sound? No, it creates a disturbance of the air, but it does not make a sound. Of course, we also have to assume no animals are present, since they have the same vibration to sound conversion engine, otherwise called ears and the brain, as we do. But hold on a minute, a tree has plenty of other biological friends around it. What about plants? Evidence that plants can and do respond to sound has mounted over recent years. 
We know that sound stimuli can make plants more tolerant towards infections, more resistant towards droughts, and even grow more quickly. In one experiment where plants were placed next to an opaque tube with water constantly rushing through it, over time, the plants grew towards the tube, suggesting they could hear the water passing through the pipe. This might come as a surprise, especially because plants lack one of the essential components of hearing, an ear. Although we don't yet fully understand how they pull it off, it's thought the bowl shape of many flowers may have evolved as a way to catch more of the vibrations around them and, in a sense, turn up the volume on their environment. The evening primrose, for example, produces a sweeter nectar roughly three minutes after hearing the sound of a bee buzzing, or a synthetic sound reproduced at a similar frequency. But it won't respond to any other frequencies, so maybe we should talk to plants to help them grow after all. But be careful how you talk to them. They don't respond well to shouting, so keep things sweet with a low, dulcet tone ideally around 115 to 250 hertz. So, it turns out, if a tree falls in a forest but no human or animal is present to hear it, it will probably still make a sound from the perspective of nearby plants. So far, we've attempted to answer this question using a combination of philosophy and science, and surprisingly, they both agree that perception plays a big role in whether or not something makes a sound. Where idealism and science differ, however, is that, according to idealism, a lack of perception equates to a lack of existence, and hence, a lack of a tree. Science, on the other hand, typically assumes something definitely does exist, even if our senses aren't experiencing it directly. Take Neptune, for example. Scientists predicted the existence of Neptune before they saw it, because there were discrepancies between calculations and data for the planet Uranus. Using the laws of physics, Einstein was able to successfully predict the bending of light and the existence of black holes. In the 1950s, scientists were able to anticipate rising CO2 levels. And we now work on the assumption that dark energy exists, a type of energy that acts in opposition to gravity. Yet, we still haven't observed it, and perhaps we never will. But as science evolves, so may the answer to the classic falling tree conundrum. Einstein believed the world continues to function exactly the same, regardless if we are around to observe it. As he so eloquently put, God does not play dice with the universe. Some quantum physicists, however, beg to differ. They argue that each of us lives within our own virtual reality of sorts, and the universe behaves in a unique way depending on who is observing it and from where. This mind-melting concept was conceived by Niels Bohr and Werner Heisenberg back in the 1920s and is known as the Copenhagen Interpretation. It's an idea so convoluted, even its creators, Bohr and Heisenberg, couldn't agree with each other about what it actually was. Whether you subscribe to quantum mechanics, established science, idealism, or pastafarianism, I think the real lesson here is that it's our experiences of life and the world around us, not the objects themselves, that give us real meaning. Perhaps in a peculiar and somewhat reckless way, this was what the timber tyrant of Weybridge was trying to tell us all by chopping down 50 trees. But let's be honest, he was probably just stupid and blind drunk. Thanks for watching. Check out my new podcast, Random Interesting Facts, available on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. Link in the description below. Thanks.